interactive discussion, sarcoma and bone secondaries. I would like to invite our panelists, Professor Katagiri, Professor Edward Wang, and Wee Ming Chen. Moderator for the session, Dr. Yogesh Manchwar. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'll take an uh, uh, opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Seema as well on the panel and uh, Dr. Laskar. We'll need a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist. So format is going to be the same as the other sessions. We are going to show cases to the panel and the audience and uh, pose a few questions that we routinely face while managing these patients in our clinics. If the audience has any questions regarding the same, please feel free to contribute to the, to the session. So answer the radiation problem. OK, so good afternoon, panelists. Uh, as I was just saying, this is going to be on case-based discussions. I'll be sharing a few cases with you, very straightforward, simple ones, and having your opinion about what would be the best way or the recommended way of managing these in our uh, clinics and hospitals. So the first case is a 53 years old housewife who presented with a swelling in the posterior aspect of the left thigh, which was non-tender, gradually, progressively increasing in size over the last two to three months. And that was the MRI picture. Clinically, she had about eight by six by five centimeters mass in the deep posterior aspect of the upper thigh. And the MRI showed this picture. X-ray did not reveal any calcification. And that's the picture. The gun biopsy was of a myxoid liposarcoma. So the MRI, a deeply located tumor. The MRI said that the size was about 10 by six by five centimeters. Gun biopsy, myxoid liposarcoma. The question now is, how do we stage this particular patient? What would be the best way of staging? Can I uh, start with Professor Katagiri? Yes. For the staging of the patient, I usually first we do the contrast enhanced CT scan of the whole body, okay. including the uh, lower leg. I, and in, if the, there's some lymph node swelling, which is suspicious for metastasis, we usually do a ultrasound uh, examination to know whether it is a reactive or a metastasis. And normally for the mixed lymph sarcoma, uh, mixed lymph sarcoma, I think it is good enough to evaluate the staging. Okay. Any particular reason for asking for a contrast enhanced CT scan? Pardon? Why, why would you want to have a contrast enhanced CT, as you just said? Pardon? What did you say? Contrast, contrast enhanced CT scan. Ah, oh, you want, uh, I should say, the necessity of contrast enhancement? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, and sometimes an um, enhanced CT shows the uh, difference between the reactive swelling of the lymph node and metastatic lymph node. And besides, we, if we see the enhanced CT closely, we can sometimes find a tumor emboli in the nearby veins. Mm -hmm. So we usually do the contrast enhanced CT scan. Okay, Professor Wang, yeah. I think one of the other reasons we do a contrast, and especially for the, the CT of the chest, we've, we've had that debate a uh, long time with the radiologists whether we should do CT contrast enhanced or not. But uh, apparently if, it's, uh, if you're trying to look for possible metastasis in the mediastinum, right. the contrast, I think, um, shows the images better than, than, than non-contrast enhanced. So okay. we'd, I'd agree that we do a okay. CT contrast okay. enhanced. Professor? Have a identical like opinion, but sometimes the patient can afford it. I, uh, I use a PET scan to survey the whole body. 
Okay, all right. So PET scan uh, versus a CT scan of the entire body or the chest, abdomen, pelvis. Uh, my question to Dr. Seema and Dr. Lashkar, what was, in your DMG, what is your preferred modality of choice? We would not, although we have PET scan, but we would not prefer doing a PET scan. We would just do a CT and a sonography of the abdomen and pelvis to rule okay. out uh, nodal disease in the abdomen. Okay, all right. Anyone for a, uh, for a full body MRI scan as, as a modality of staging? Yeah. <coughs> Sometimes, mixed okay. life sarcoma has a spinal metastasis, mm -hmm. and it is sometimes difficult to detect with CT scan or PET scan. So we sometimes do a MRI of the whole spine for a large liposarcoma cases. Okay. The, yeah. the MRI would be a suboptimal investigation for detecting, picking up pulmonary metastasis. So if you're using it as a single modality, that would not be optimal. Yeah, but as Professor Katagari just stated, in cases of mixed liposarcomas, to screen the spine. Yeah, especially. if you have an yeah. additional thing. Yes. Yeah, and in certain cases like clear cell sarcomas and alveolar soft part. For a brain. For the brain. brain, yeah. Okay, okay. so the question to the audience, uh, we would like to have a show of hands. Uh, how many of you would stage it with just a CT scan of the chest, abdopelvis? How, sh any show of hands? CT scan? Okay. How many would do a full body MRI? Okay, there are a few. And PET scan as a primary staging modality? All right, there are still quite a few as far as PET CT is concerned. All right, so what are the exact guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, which are uh, category 2A uh, level of evidence? Say that CT scan chest without contrast is preferred, but that's for the chest, as Professor uh, Wong just pointed out. For mediastinal disease, yes, probably would take a contrast. And if you're going to screen the abdomen and pelvis, with contrast is preferred. In specific cases of angiosarcomas, leomyosarcomas, and mixoid round cell liposarcomas, you will be adding and contrast enhanced abdominal and pelvic CT scans. MRI total spine, as the panel rightly pointed out, should be considered for mixoid and round cell liposarcomas. MRI brain for alveolar soft part sarcoma and angiosarcomas. And PET CT, there's quite a lot of debate on this particular case. And sometimes it's been used, especially in uh, recurrent diseases where it has to be uh, uh, treated with resection again. The UK guidelines have echoed these particular NCCN guidelines. And there has been this study by the Spanish uh, group which have said that PET CT is specifically useful in determining the sarcomatous changes in multiple neurofibromatosis and in cases where a recurrent disease is there and you're planning a very aggressive surgery. Okay, so this coming back to this particular patient, she was uh, non-metastatic. We have done a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and there were, this was the solitary lesion. Uh, how would we, uh, what would be our thought process as far as the treatment is concerned? I'll start with the orthopedic oncologist first. Uh, Professor Chen, to begin with, yeah. Uh, the no distant metastasis, I prefer to do surgery first because uh, okay. I think the margin very close to the neurovascular bundle, but I think it's a still, re uh, still resectable. And after surgery, we have to apply post op radiation and chemotherapy for this patient because uh, mixoid liposarcoma is a very, very dangerous tumor. Okay. Uh, very easy to spray, spray out and to lung is my routine. Right. So, uh, Professor Wang, um, you share the thoughts? Or? Yes, um, I, I, I go ahead with surgery first. All right. Any, same, role, same of, any role of chemotherapy? Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask whether if this patient has some neurological symptom or not. No. She just came with a complaint of a lump. Okay. Yeah. And looking for, looking the MRI scan, yeah. I think that vessels are far, mm -hmm. but the sciatic nerve is very near. Yes. Close proximity to the tumor. So I would do a preoperative radiotherapy, 40 gray first, mm -hmm. and then do a surgery. Okay. And Your opinion on the chemo part first? No, no. 
No chemo. No, no chemo. New adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay. Sina? Yeah, there is no role of new adjuvant chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. We have only retrospective analysis of phase two studies. Okay. If upfront surgery is feasible, surgery should be attempted first. Okay. All right. So, uh, a question to the audience. How many of you would think of giving a new adjuvant chemotherapy in this particular scenario? It's a myxoid liposarcoma. It's solitary. Anyone willing to give new adjuvant chemotherapy? Okay, we have one, one hand there. We have two. All right. Upfront surgery? Yeah. Quite a few. Quite a few. Now, as Professor Katagiri pointed out, the question of uh, giving... Uh, using re, uh, radiotherapy, that is a preoperative radiotherapy. But before we go on to the radiotherapy part, let's quickly see what, what are the guidelines for new adjuvant chemo. And as Seema said, uh, there is not a very strong data in favor of a new adjuvant chemo. Most of the data is from phase two trial and retrospective services. However, if the MDT decides in cases where the lesions are large and they are borderline salvageable, probably those are the cases where you would think of giving a new adjuvant chemo. Uh, there is this updated meta-analysis which showed a marginal efficacy of chemotherapy in localized resectable soft tissue sarcoma, but this particular benefit has to be weighed against the toxicity that results out of the chemo. And the largest trial, the URTC uh, TC 62931, said that there is no clear benefit from giving chemotherapy in local control of the disease, relapse free survival or overall survival, and it should be considered only in special situations. However, there, these, all these studies are on a heterogeneous group. You know, there are multiple histotypes in this. So, Seema, your opinion about histotype-specific chemotherapy? I mean, not in first-line setting. We have a okay. trial which was published in Lancet where the patients were randomized into IFOS, adriamycin versus histotype-specific chemotherapy. Okay. In fact, the survival was poor in patients where histotype-specific was given. So, upfront... Uh, IFOS adriamycin remains the standard of choice, but however, in second line setting, when a patient has metastasized and progressed on first line therapy, then histotype specific chemotherapy should be chosen. And I would like to add one more point to that EORTC trial. Yeah. Uh, the EORTC trial uh, and the EBSTG trial, these are two large trials that looked at the benefit of chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. And the combined analysis found that overall there is no benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy, but only in subgroup of patient where they had undergone marginal resection, where surgery was R plus, their giving when chemotherapy had some benefit, but not in patients who have completely resected R0 resection. Okay. And you're not in favor of a histotype specific chemotherapy? Not in first line setting. Okay. okay. All right. So that's the trial that uh, Dr. Seema is talking about. Uh, histotype specific chemo also did not show any benefit of new adjuvant tailored chemotherapy over the standard chemotherapy regimen. So coming back to uh, the surgeons uh, and Dr. Lashkar as well, uh, what would be the role of radiation as Dr. Katagari pointed out, he would probably think of using a pre-op radiation in this. Uh, Dr. Lashkar, your, your thoughts? So as we said in the beginning, if it is clearly resectable, then that would be the ideal way to go about it. But if you think it is borderline, uh, like we mentioned that the sciatic nerve was closed, yeah. close, yeah. in them you can definitely consider preoperative radiation therapy. And there is data to show that there is good outcome after preoperative radiation therapy to a dose of 50 gram, 25 yeah. fractions. Yeah, okay, all right. So I, I, would, I would come to this particular uh, two studies and a question to Professor Katagiri. We have a very large study from Japan from the database, the national database, 8,288 patients, and only 19% of those patients have received radiotherapy, versus the SEER analysis which of 6,960 patients, which said that radiation was associated with improved survival in patients with high-grade tumors. This is the adju adjuvant part, the uh, adjuvant RT part. So my question to you is, when most of the world is saying that RT is implemented in most of the high-grade, large-size, high-risk cases or tumors, why would you know the centers in Japan use only in in 19 percent of the cases radiation in only 19 percent of the cases? Any specific ideology or thought process behind this? Frame the 
reframe yeah. the question. Okay, I can, okay, I can reframe, reframe the question for you. Uh, oh, so, compared to the rest of the world, we see that lesser number of patients receive radiation as far as the Japanese data goes. Can I, can I? So in, in, in Japan, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. which patients do you select for radiotherapy? Okay. Yeah. In Japan, normally we treat the rejectable soft tissue sarcoma without radiation therapy. Exactly. Yeah. And radiation therapy is only uh, prescribed for the patient who has a very large or well, very adjacent to the neurovascular bundle or who has a very poor response to chemotherapy, such as in increasing size during the chemotherapy, only those patients are treated with radiotherapy. So normally, we treat patients without radiotherapy. But in this case, which I showed before, yeah. the nerve was very adjacent to the yes. tumor. So I will prefer to do a radiotherapy to, uh, spare, uh, to save the nerve. Okay, so we have uh, Professor Katagiri going in for a pre-operative radiation and Professor Wang and Dr. Chin thinking of an upfront surgical resection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So my question to Dr. Lashkar, like there are some chemosensitive tumors, soft tissue sarcomas, are there any histotype specific radiotherapy sensitive tumors? And when do we sort of think of using radiation so, so if you look at the retroperitoneal sarcoma data, from there, there is information that comes and tells us that liposarcomas uh, are sensitive uh, to radiation therapy. And uh, so in, in those patients, there is data to show that there is benefit of doing. But although all these data is not really, they are not randomized data and they're not very robust, but there is some indication that there is, yes, benefit of. Uh, benefit of. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Since we had a 2-1 divergence on the decision of radiation, so I, I would ask uh, Professor Chen and Professor Wong, uh, will you be giving, and I'm sure you will be giving, probably thinking of giving a post-operative radiotherapy in this particular case that yeah, we are discussing? Yeah, I, I routinely do uh, post-op radiation, but, but uh, some doctors prefer to use, like Dr. New use uh, pre-op. I just use pre-op in uh, huge tumors, such as in pelvis or close to spine or by the organ. Otherwise, I prefer to, to do post-op radiation. Post -op radiation. Okay. So why? Yes, um, we do a lot of radiotherapy also. Yeah. Um, but again, similar um, criteria for using it. Um, large tumors, tumors which are very close, which mm -hmm. we think are probably, we're going to get uh, poor margins on it. Um, in those cases, we do give preoperative radiotherapy. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a problem sometimes in our situation where the queue for preoperative radiotherapy is very long, so yeah. we're, we don't have a choice except to give postoperative radiotherapy. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, so those are, that's, that's the current uh, uh, literature. Preoperative radiotherapy has a better long-term functional outcome, equivalent rates of disease control with, as compared with postoperative radiotherapy, however, has an increased risk of acute post-op wound complications. If we are talking about post-op radiotherapy, and this is where I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Lashkar again, uh, in this particular case, what is your opinion about using uh, brachytherapy? Well, we would definitely evaluate uh, intraoperatively for interstitial brachytherapy, but uh, we will have to choose our patients appropriately. And how would that be? And that would depend on uh, the intraop assessment, where I'll check whether I would be able to cover the entire tumor bed adequately in the bracket therapy volume. Okay. So that is one very important thing. The other, uh, you know, the standard factors are like proximity to neurovascular bundle and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for a beginner, those are contraindications. Right. But uh, but you can circumvent these problems if you have done a few and you experience, and then you know how to spare these neurovascular bundles from the injury that you can cause. So, so we would evaluate intraoperatively, and the clear contraindications, up, you know, the relative contraindications would be proximity to neurovascular bundles. I would not do it if I am not able to cover the tumor bed adequately. 
Okay, all right. So the orthopedic oncologists in the panel, uh, would you think of using a brachy in this? Yeah, about 20 years ago, I returned from Mayo Clinic, United States. I started to use brachytherapy, but at the beginning, I have some complications such as uh, necrosis, subtension necrosis and joint contracture. Uh, I choose the case uh, close to the neurovascular bundle, so because the uh, complication is not acceptable, so I quit it. Now I routinely use external living radiation. We have no experience with using brachytherapy okay. for extremity soft tissue sarcoma, mm -hmm. so I can't answer that. Okay. We have no brachytherapy cases in, in my institution, but I wonder why if why the post op radiotherapy? Because the, in the literature, the post radiation uh, post operative radiotherapy requires a much larger field and much higher dose, yeah. and the late complication is much higher compared to the pre-operative yes. radiotherapy. Yeah, because so, current guidelines, which are again uh, level 2A, they are being recommended for majority of the patients with high-grade tumors after the surgical resection of primary tumor and for select patients with large or marginally excised low-grade tumors as well. So uh, if I can come in uh, yeah. on the volume that we are talking about, mm -hmm. the standard volume that the, the books would tell you is a margin of about four to five centimeters for a high-grade tumor for a soft yes. tissue sarcoma in the adjuvant setting. Yeah. But the current evidence that is coming in, and which actually there are two large trials, uh, one of them, a UK trial, the Vortex trial, where they have reduced the margin from five centimeters to two centimeter, and they have shown equally good outcomes. And another important study which came from uh, the Canadian group, uh, Brian O'Sullivan and his group, where they try to do pre-op uh, with uh, the sparing of the skin, which reduced complications. So skin sparing intensity modulated radiation therapy and reduced volume external beam radiation therapy post-operative th would reduce the complications significantly. So, and the doses are also coming down now. It's come down to 50 gray. We don't really need to go to 60 to 66 right. gray. Not even for the boost? No, we would, uh, the new data that is coming in shows that you could actually reduce the dose to 50 gray for microscopic disease. Okay. Yeah, Professor Wang. The fear of um, preoperative -op, pre radiotherapy in terms of wound complications, yeah. we haven't really experienced uh, too many problems with uh, operative, um, the complications post-op, as long as we've got good soft tissue coverage. So right. as long as we think it is indicated and we can cue the patient for pre-op, we go for preoperative. Right. Okay. So that's the data on brachy <clears throat> uh, by Dr. Lashkar himself. Shows good result even with low-dose brachytherapy. Uh, coming to the surveillance part, this patient has been operated now. Good margins, R0 resection, has been treated with uh, post-operative radiotherapy. And... Uh, we have to, you know, keep this patient on the surveillance. What would be your recommendation as far as, you know, how often and how we should investigate this patient? Professor Katagini? For the post-operative surveillance? Yes. Yes. Uh, normally, we take a CT scan, a six-month interval, mm -hmm. and X-ray, three-month interval. Three after surgery, three months, take X-ray film, and then after three months, take CT scan, CT scans. and okay. then after three months, X-ray again, and mm -hmm. then after three months, uh, CT scan. CT scan. So for the first two to three years, it's a more intensive follow-up with more investigations? Oh, uh, I do an intensive, this intensive follow-up for about two years, yes. and then and along the interval, two or four or five months, and then continue to follow up until 10 years. Okay. Professor Wang and Professor Chen, do you agree? Is the plan the same for you? Um, I'm not sure how we, uh, we, but we agree we do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's three months chest x-ray alternating with CT scan okay. and more intensive for the first two years and then um, less. But we continue following them up at least until okay. five years. Okay, so if I have to ask you, how do we, how do we uh, uh, keep them on surveillance as far as the local uh, examination, local disease is concerned? Do we image, do you image them locally as well? 
for, the, no. for any recurrence locally? No, we no. don't do that routinely unless there is any um, indication that there might be uh, local recurrence. But um, in the context of um, the kind of margins that we achieved during surgery and the kind of adjuvant that the patient received. Right. Right. So, Mr. Chen? If I can, uh, if I can comment, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. So, so after today morning, uh, today's uh, uh, lectures by Andreas and yes. Prof. Grimer and, of course, uh, our own uh, uh, Ajay's, uh, uh, Dr. Puri's yeah. uh, paper, yeah. we would not be probably as aggressive in doing uh, scans, scans. Okay. Uh, because that we have shown in our own randomized trial that it didn't really make a difference. Right. And and the frequency of follow-ups. Yeah. So I would probably wait for the app that uh, is going to come very soon. And uh, we, but uh, till then, I think we would do X-rays, clinical examination, yes. and we do do sonography of the scars as okay. a for, uh, local okay. evaluation. Okay. All right, Professor Chen. Yeah. I, if a high-grade sarcoma routinely follow up the patient every three months in the first two years, mm -hmm. and uh, two to, between two to five years, fifty years yeah. every six months, and after five years, every one year. Yeah. Including high-grade tumor, including chest CAT scan, okay. chest CT, and the local MI. Okay, all right. Uh, but uh, low-grade tumor, low-grade tumor, yeah. I sometimes I switch to sonogram mm -hmm. and chest is enough, right. x-ray is enough. Right. But this, this morning, Dr. Grimmer gave us a very nice talk about yeah. uh, local recurrence time and the mass uh, interval. Yeah. So he mentioned about probably five years later, you mm -hmm. still have 10% distant metastasis. Yes. So we have to follow up the patient at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's my own principle, at least okay. 10 years. Okay. Because uh, local recurrence usually in the first three years and distant metastasis in fir in first 50 years, five years. Yeah, it's so pretty experience. much pretty much what the NCCN uh, guidelines uh, recommend is what Dr. Chen has uh, beautifully summarized right now. Anyone from the audience has any other uh, different method of uh, surveillance? Someone would like to comment or say something about you know any different mm -hmm. investigation that you use for surveillance in these patients or such a patient? Yeah, so Nathan. Yeah, so I, I was listening intently at the discussion, uh, and I think it's because maybe it's the methodology of the discussion, but at no point did we bring in the idea of a TLS-1216 uh, fusion transcript. And you see, the problem with mixed cell liposarcomas is, yes, on the grand spectrum of things, we all accept it's an intermediate grade. Yeah. But if you're really looking for the high risk of going to spinal mats and brain mats and looking at the follow-up, Yes. It's, we, we need to go back, you see. We need to go back and ask ourselves, is this a 1216 yeah. uh, positive uh, tumor? Mm -hmm. Now, if you decide that you're not going to it, I think then you're behoved to now look at MRI spi uh, spines uh, routinely in the follow-up, whether or not this is okay. going to have prognostic significance. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I, I just like to make that point. I was getting, you know, I was waiting for that to come right. so, so that, that was the point I was going to come to. Uh, a local MRI as well as uh, MRI of the spine for surveillance. Uh, the panel's opinion on that? Do you use it in the surveillance? Yes? As for the MRI surveillance, um, I think this is a mix mixed liposarcoma case, so that the MRI scan of the spine is mandatory. Okay. But not so often, perhaps once a year. But um, locally, the, if I take the CT scan for systemic to detect the system metastasis, metastasis, I can include the local area with the CT. So I think MRI scan of the local con, uh, check is, would not be necessary. It is uh, carried out by CT scan. Okay. But the MRI scan of the spine is mandatory. We right. have to. We, we don't. We shouldn't forget the MRI scan of the spine for the mixed life sarcoma. All right. Uh, Professor Wang, Professor Chen. Once a once, year. Once a year. Once is stated, yeah. uh, two years. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wang, Professor Chen, any inputs on that? If the patient can, you have some complaint after surgery during the follow-up, 
for mixed liposarcoma, I, I will give the patient to check MI PET. Okay. It's not a CT PET, okay. MI PET, okay. for safety, because uh, sometimes this, this the metastasis to spine mm -hmm. is a uh, very high risk, very dangerous. Yeah. So in all your patients, you will be doing that? Uh, not all patients, just patient complaint. You have some complaint. You suspect distant metastasis. Okay. All right. And you cannot make sure your margin is clear or not. And uh, during the surgery, I think that you doubt the margin uh, too close to the neurovascular bundle or the tumor size too big, especially located in pelvis. Right. I, I want to use the MI pad to check that for safety. Otherwise, in extremity, like this case, I think local MI is enough. Mm -hmm. Sima, you wanted to add something. Yeah, most of the local recurrences are detected on clinical examination. Okay. If on clinical examination nothing is there, and if patient on examination there is no signs or symptoms suggestive of spinal involvement, mm -hmm. then I don't think that doing MRI just for surveillance is justified. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's that's what uh, the guidelines from from UK say, and I believe they are. Uh, Dr. Rabu Kramer has been having a big role in uh, uh, structuring these, and they don't uh, image more than a chest X-ray. They would just do further imaging only if there is any suspicious disease progression in those patients. And the rest of the follow-up is basically mainly dependent on the uh, symptomatology and the patient's uh, symptoms. Most of the local recurrences are detected by the patient himself, and Dr. Grimer's paper and Dr. Leeges' paper has questioned the cost effectiveness of doing an MRI scan in all the patients. And of course, as he was mentioning during his paper, we need to have a stratified approach and just do it only for the higher risk uh, cases. Okay, so we will move on to another case situation. This is a 43 years old gentleman. That's the mass he's got. It's a, it's a uh, liposarcoma again. And that's the MRI scan, and he has presented with a bilateral pulmonary metastatic disease. There are six nodules in all on both the sides together. So how would our approach change now? I mean, uh, the surgeons first, and then the medical oncologists and the radiation. Sorry, what did you say the histology was? It's a liposarcoma. Liposarcoma. Yeah. What's, up, what's up type? No, it's not been subtyped. It's it's a pleomorphic liposarcoma. Okay. Um, in this case, I would uh, for the staging, um, I'd probably do either the CT, whole body CT, or at least the PET PET CT. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, the approach, I'd probably not approach it as surgical excision first. Mm -hmm. um, I'd come. I'd go to my uh, good friends the. Medical oncologist. Okay, okay. Professor, Kata. yeah, Professor Chen. Uh, in this patient, because uh, with uh, distant metastasis, it's too long, so I prefer to use pre-op uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy first. I refer mm -hmm. to a medical oncologist. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, Professor Katagiri. Uh, for this case, this has a six lung metastasis yes. with a large local tumor. Yeah. So I prefer to do a chemotherapy. And for the local control, I do a radiotherapy mm -hmm. concurrently. Mm -hmm. We usually um, use an ICE regimen, iphosphamide, huh. carboplatin, and etoposide okay. for this case. And during the chemotherapy, we do the radiotherapy as well. Okay. Uh, any, anyone from the audience would like to go in for an upfront surgical excision? Uh, remove the local disease, do a metastatectomy, and then maybe think about uh, giving chemotherapy. Yeah, Dr. Mandeep Shah is of that opinion. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. A few hands. Sorry? Impending fungation. That is what he has pointed out. Okay. All right. Seema, your inputs? There are six lung metastases. Yes. So I don't think that are there is yeah, at presentation. Yeah. So R0 resection, I don't think it is possible. And if R0 resection is not possible upfront, then we should go for chemotherapy rather than doing R plus resection. Okay. Suppose an R0 was possible? If R0 is possible, then surgery should be done first. Okay. All right. 
So the panel seems to be, uh, you know, united in the opinion that this patient would go for a chemotherapy first and then uh, go on to the local management, depending upon the response to that particular chemotherapy. And as uh, Professor Katagiri was pointing out, there is a first line and a second line. And yes, doxorubicin and ifosfamide are the preferred med uh, drugs. The UK guidelines say that surgery, if R0 is possible, or otherwise, you would follow a similar uh, methodology. And if they are unresectable, you would think about stereotactic ablative radiotherapy or RF ablation as palliative methodology. Now, now we have brought up this particular case because there is a there is a survival difference between non-metastatic presentation versus metastatic presentation. And as uh, Seema had presented her data, there was a significant difference in patients presenting with meds, without meds, I believe 17% versus 52% uh, or 58%, something of that sort. 68, right? 68 yeah. in the primary. Yeah, in the primary, without metastasis, obviously. So that's, that's the reason. And uh, the outcome with surgical uh, resection in soft tissue sarcoma presenting with metastatic disease is around 5-year survival around 17% according to this particular article and the median survival is roughly around 17 months. Now question to the panel again, how do we decide, uh, you know, what's the cutoff for a curative intent in such particular patient? How many metastases? Is there a number that we can assign, you know, single met, two mets, four mets, six mets? How, how do we decide when we resect, when we treat them with chemo or when we palliate them. Okay. Professor Chen? Uh, I will consult chest surgeon because uh, yeah. in my hospital we usually use uh, Da Vinci surgery or mm -hmm. scope surgery yes. for lung. Yeah. They, because they can evaluate the case scan carefully uh, to see after surgery the lung function to decide uh, how many mass you can take it out. Okay. Right. Okay. You mentioned about uh, stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy for yeah. pulmonary metastasis. Yeah. Again, it would depend on uh, how many do you have. Yes. Uh, only if you feel that you would be able to treat all of them with a radical intent, you would go ahead and do stereotactic radiosurgery um, in a way for the lung metastasis. If you have 10 metastases, it doesn't make sense doing right. SPRT. Right. Professor Wang? But I'd, I'd like also to take a look at the response to the right. chemotherapy to the chemo. before yeah. making a decision yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Professor Category? Yeah. I agree with this, this, this opinion. Yeah. I first look the chemotherapy, chemotherapy, chemotherapy effect, and mm -hmm. if the number does not increase mm -hmm. and the chemotherapy is effective, mm -hmm. we'll go on a lung surgery. Okay. All right. Yeah. <coughs> so, that's, that's what the re recent papers talk about. Some of them have said that, you know, more the number of metastasis, obviously poorer is going to be the result, but that number has been as less as anything more than one. And there have been papers which have been talking about, and, you know, number of six, which, you know, they have resected about five pulmonary nodules on an average, and then decided if there were more, as Professor Category was stating, give chemotherapy, assess the response if the disease has shrunk or being static, then think about surgery in that particular situation. So my question to the panel again, coming back to surveillance, will the surveillance now change in this particular situation? A case which has presented with metastasis to begin with. Will you be more intensive in sort of uh, doing investigations post-treatment or post-operatively if, if you have operated on this patient? Yes. The, the patient is Yes, not. the patient has been treated. Uh, metastatectomy has been done. Local disease has been removed. And now the patient has been, is to be kept on surveillance. Will your surveillance be the same or it will be more intensive? Sima says more yeah. intensive. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And we have to do CT thorax in this surveillance. And okay. not the but will it be at a, at a frequent interval as compared to the previous case? Yeah. All right. Yes, Mr. Chen? Yeah, because uh, the patient had bad record of a long metastasis. So after surgery, I have to follow up the patient very carefully. Mm -hmm. So in the past, uh, my patient usually three months interval to, to follow up case scan. 
But in this case, I prefer to two to three months. Okay. It's for safety. Okay. Yeah, Professor Wang. I keep the interval the same. Um, All right. Intensity of chemotherapy. I'm very tempted, of course, because of the past um, mm -hmm. history to be more intensive. But I'm not sure that even if I pick up uh, another lesion, that it will make a big difference. Um, so I, I think I just keep the same kind of um, surveillance, same interval, and the same same pattern. Okay. Uh, I do the same uh, interval surveillance. Uh, uh, interval is three months. I think if we do the more intensive surveillance, the result will not will be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what the guidelines talk about. More or less, the surveillance is the same as to the case that has been treated, which was non-metastatic per primum. Okay. So we are doing well as far as the time is concerned. So we have a lot of time to discuss the further cases. Uh, and this is a case of a 24-year-old lady who presented uh, with a post-total thyroidectomy for a follicular CA thyroid, post-radioiodine treatment. 17 months later, she started complaining of pain around her right hip joint. And this turned out to be an iliac metastasis of follicular carcinoma. And she was having pain, which was not very severe. The VAS was around four to five. It was solitary. And that was the further imaging. I would like to ask uh, the panel what would be the, the ideology of treating this particular patient. Yes. So follicular CA thyroid, solitary metastasis to the bone. Yes, this is a young lady with yeah. a solitary thyroid cancer metastasis to a pelvis. Yes. And she's expected to live very much long. Yeah. Sometimes patients live longer than 10 years. Yeah. So there's a two choice. One is to go to a radical surgery like osteosarcoma, and another is do a definitive radiotherapy. Yeah. And mm. that's that's it, exactly the question for the panel. Yeah. In how, the past, how? I prefer to do a surgery. Okay. But sometimes I encounter the massive bleeding during the treatment during yes. the surgery. So now I prefer to do a definitive radio surgery using IMRT or sometimes proton beam. Okay. And, and, and interestingly, the bone modified agents such as zolodonic acid or uh, other drug is uh, some supportive effect, enhancement effect to a radio therapy. So okay. I. Currently, I do a proton beam and bone modifying agent drugs such okay. as dronic acid okay. for this patient. Yeah. So you have changed from a right, you know, a ideology of a, a wide excision for these particular lesions to now onto a conservative approach. Professor yeah. Wang, do you share his views? The patient has received uh, radioiodine treatment. Yes. Uh, completed the whole course. She, or, yeah. It, she she has received. Uh, she has. She's on radioiodine treatment currently. Um, I, I wonder if I could try. Um, we'll take a look at the radioiodine uh, treatment again because I'm, I think they're supposed to get another course of radioiodine treatment yes. through the through through the entire course. Yes. Um, but if that but, doesn't yeah. work. The question was, if we are thinking about surgery, what should be the extent of uh, surgery? Oh, As okay. Professor Katagiri pointed out, will you be very aggressive in managing this particular case? Yes. And we, ha we had this uh, uh, data about solitary metastasis treatment in renal and follicular, uh, or rather thyroid uh, carcinoma mets. Would you be, uh, how, how, how robust is that data as far as uh, the actually located lesions are concerned. Yeah, I'd also be very aggressive about treating this, especially it's a single metastasis. Okay. Professor Chen, yeah. yeah because the solitary metastasis usually occur in renal cell carcinoma and thyroid cancer. So in this case, if, if iodine 131 doesn't work, then we have to pursue another method. So in the patient, because, uh, because uh, a little dangerous for fracture, we have to apply denosma first. Mm -hmm. Give patient denosma injection, high dose injection first to prevent fracture, and then you have to recommend the patient to use crutches 
for worker to support uh, right limb. Don't put full body, full weight bearing on, on her right, right foot, okay? Right. And the uh, second one, because uh, it's a solitary metastasis, according to literature and experience, we have to do Y station mm -hmm. for this patient. If, okay. if other method doesn't work. Okay, all right. Because so, the lady is too young, yeah. is too young. So I think uh, the, the surgeons in the panel uh, agree to a, to a wide resection in this particular yeah. case. No, no intralesional surgery as far as the management of the pain is concerned for yeah. this lady. Okay, and uh, before surgery, because uh, it's a big surgery for P1 and P2 surgery, so before that, uh, I refer to uh, proton therapy first. Okay. Proton therapy, if proton therapy doesn't work, yeah. and still solitary, without metastasis, we have to agree surgery. It's okay. a final step. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Lashkar? So there's a disclaimer here. I'm not a head and neck specialist, but my wife is a head and neck specialist. So in the car, we do hear a little bit of how thyroid cancers are managed. So based on that, I can tell you that uh, we would possibly do another uh, radio iron imaging mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. to see whether there is disease elsewhere. Right. And if it still remains there, and what I can understand from the surgeons, it's going to be a very morbid surgery, yes. uh, extensive surgery. Yeah. And we have a modality of treatment available. I would recommend uh, if it is just localized to do localized radiation therapy. Okay. Conformal IMRT, and if you have protons, you can do protons, but I mean, it's your choice, but yeah. radiation therapy. Yeah, Seema? Yeah, you said that the patient uh, relapsed while on radioactive therapy. So disease-free yes. interval is very less. Yes. So in that About scenario, one and a half years. About one and a half years. One and a half yeah. years. Okay. So Dr. Lashkar and Dr. Katagiri probably have the same opinion. Any, any, op any other opinion from the, from the uh, house? Do you, yes, sir. Any other way that you could probably manage this patient? Uh, I agree that in solitary metastasis, right uh, excision uh, you know, improves survival. But in this case, uh, the thyroid cancer is sensitive to radiation. So. But if you apply direct radiation, so uh, iodine treatment will be less effective. So in these cases, uh, I usually I prefer to apply first curettage to remove uh, the amount of uh, cancer uh, cells in the body. And then uh, after curettage, I apply uh, cementation and then iodine treatment because it's a special type of cancer. If it were a kidney cancer, so the strategy will be different. So I will go on with the white excision. But for this particular cancer, I prefer mm -hmm. to apply first uh, curettage, bone cementing, and then iodine. And if it doesn't work, then external radiation and so on. Right, right. So you would do an open surgery for the cementing? Open surgery for the cementation, but yeah. not white excision for this particular right. case. Right, Okay, any other opinions? So, yeah. Yes, sir. Because, because thyroid cancer is a vessel rich tumor, so you have to be very careful the breathing during surgery. Yeah. So, do you like to use a pre op embrization? Yeah. yeah. I believe, yes. If it's an intralesional surgery, then pre op embolization will be necessary. As the panel said, that the patient is expected to go on for a long time. And uh, this particular patient had a very good prognosis as far as the scoring system is concerned. And we are fortunate Dr. Katagiri is here. Uh, that was the reason we actually put up this particular case. She had a very low score and expected to have a good survival, but was having pain during her activities of daily living. We managed this particular patient conservatively. We did, uh, we did continue with the radioiodine treatment. We did percutaneous radiofrequency ablation and percutaneous uh, cementoplasty. Uh, we did not uh, do any preoperative embolization since we had a preoperative uh, approach, uh, sorry, uh, percutaneous approach. And this is a long-term follow-up. The left-hand side x-ray is August 2015, and she uh, continues to be symptom-free and disease-free uh, till date. This, the, the latest x-ray is on our right. 
There are other modalities of management. Uh, the literature talks about percutaneous cementoplasty and RFA. Uh, it talks about cryoablation and cementoplasty, microwave thermal ablation, and using uh, magnetic uh, resonance guided uh, high intensity focused ultrasound as well. Uh, uh, the, we, except for the RFA and the percutaneous cementoplasty, our center, we are not having the HIFU. But yes, these, there are. Uh, these uh, particular treatment modalities that have been di discussed in the literature as well for these particular patients. Yeah, moving on to our next case, that's a 62 years old lady. She is a known case of uh, breast cancer, treated about again one and a half years earlier. She had a T2N1M0 disease, treated with modified radical ma mastectomy. She had ERPR positive that time. Her tool was negative, and after one and a half years, she started complaining of backache and a gradual reduction in the power in the legs. Started having difficulty in walking, and on examination had a grade three power. And that's her x-ray, and that's the MRI scan. I would like to tell you that she was oligometastatic at this particular stage. At 18 months, she had very few flat bone metastases in the ribs and the uh, other vertebrae, not more than four in all, and that was the MRI scan. There was this L2 disease with spinal cord compression. And the question now will be how to manage this particular one. What will be your approach? Yeah, Seema. Seema wants to go in first. So this patient has a good long-term survival being ERPR positive. Yeah. And at baseline also, she was T2N1 disease. Mm -hmm. And breast cancer is sensitive to radiation therapy. OK. Yeah. So we should go ahead with radiation. All right. Yeah, uh, Professor Wang. Sorry, this is, this sorry, sorry the, the mic is not on. Has this patient received any kind of systemic treatment? Yes, she's received chemotherapy uh, okay. uh, at the time of, after her uh, previous surgery, the breast mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah. So the routine uh, one. Uh, atomicin based and four cycles of black platelet axle. Yeah, in patients like these, we would still go for radiation, uh -huh. radiation first. Mm -hmm. yeah. Professor and Katagiri agrees. Monitor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, you agree? Yes. Looking at uh, actual image of the MRI scan, yeah. there's uh, some space left for the cord. Yes. Or, the, or cord equima. Yeah. So I go on a uh, radiation and steroid first. Okay. And if the patient do not respond to this treatment, we mm -hmm. go on a decompressive surgery. So right. the radiation and steroid first. And then if the patient becomes worse, we do a surgery. All right. Yeah. Professor Chen? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I uh, suggest the patient to do radiation first mm -hmm. and put on brace to protect the spine, mm -hmm. and uh, already have chemotherapy. I, I want to know the marker, because uh, now, nowadays, yeah. the target therapy, immunotherapy, is very, very useful yeah. for breast cancer. Yeah. She goes so here, I have yeah, a lot of cases. It's a miracle. The tumor disappear after target therapy. Yeah. So we don't, we don't have to do surgery and have more time to break off. So she was ERPR positive, HER2 negative. Sima, you would like to have a fresh marker on the metastatic, uh, from the metastatic tissue? No, because clinically she's behaving like ERPR positive. Yeah. After one and a half years, she has bone only metastasis. There is no visceral metastasis. So there right. is no need to repeat biopsy to confirm the ERPR status. All right, okay. And there are many lines of hormonal therapy available. Yeah. And even CDK46 inhibitor is also available. Okay, Dr. Lashkar. So just, uh, uh, yeah. A small caution when we are deciding about radiation therapy, mm -hmm. what we look at is what is the thing that is causing the cord compression? Right. Is it the soft tissue that is causing the compression or is it the bone fragment that is causing? Yes. So we need to be very sure that it's not the bone fragment because the bone fragment will never put, go back to its original position after right. radiation. Although you will have good pain relief, but so you need to be sure about the bone fragment versus soft tissue causing the cord compression. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, radiation is the way to go for this. Okay, all right. Yeah, Anand? Okay, yeah. Professor Neo? Uh, 
for uh, uh, breast cancer, so uh, if we evaluate for the spine per, uh, metastasis, first we say uh, the I mean the spinal cord is safe or whether the strength I mean is strong enough of the bone. So from MR, it's very hard to evaluate the strength of the bone. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the patient has no severe symptoms, no nerve defect, just back pain. Yeah. So uh, if, I mean, uh, so because I don't know the history of this patient, the treatment, if it's newly diagnosis, so I'll be, because it's ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 negative, so I think the first treatment would be uh, medicine. Okay. Medication would be uh, with right. the hormone treatment, and okay. then they will, uh, without the, uh, the weight bearing, and we'll see. So, because they got some mass in the canal, mm -hmm. so uh, in China maybe the radiologist will not give the radiation because if get the radiation, it would, uh, I mean, uh, give more symptoms uh, from uh, the nerve system. Right. So she would be she would be going in a brace and then undergoing a medical. No, just just uh, just lie on. Okay, we, Dr. Ranjit wants to put in a comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I, I am essentially a spine surgeon doing a little bit of oncology, so I would like to comment on this. I am concerned about an impending mechanical instability there. Okay. Uh, because yeah. uh, as far as the classification by uh, Asdurian goes, it's, I would put it in Asdurian 3, which is an impending uh, fracture. Mm -hmm. So I would like to do a CT scan to see how much of bone is left behind okay. and then decide whether to go for a stabilization, decompression and stabilization or have okay. a radiotherapy up front. So okay. that would be my approach for that. Yeah, so uh, we had a PET CT done for her and uh, it didn't show a very drastic compression. The compression was about just 20 to 25 percent. No, but how much of bone is left behind to support that column, anterior column? Yeah. That's what, that is more... Uh, I would think more in, important. There is disease in the entire anterior column, but the posterolateral uh, elements are not involved. The on the sorry. on the on the left hand side they are involved. On the right hand side they are not. I'm sorry. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, then I I would think of uh, putting a I mean decompress putting an in, instrument behind rather than using an external brace an internal bracing before going for radi radiation radiotherapy. Yeah. So uh, most of the. Uh, Experts would agree that they would go in for an external radiotherapy and surgery is reserved when the treatment, uh, the patient does not respond to the treatment or the neuro deficit progresses or as Dr. Ranjit pointed out, there is mechanical instability uh, in the patient and clinically significant neuro, uh, neural compression which uh, and the neuro deficit progresses. So these are the only areas where uh, <clears throat> we would think of going in for a surgical management. And again, a scoring system uh, devised by Professor Katagiri will come into play. And there are various uh, uh, scoring systems as well as far as the vertebral uh, lesions are concerned. One uh, is Professor Tokuhashi, Professor Tomita. So do we routinely normally employ these in deciding uh, on the management of uh, uh, patients in all the cases? Uh, actually, what type of treatment uh, to decide what, that, what type of treatment is optimal for the patient, I think the prognostic, to know the prognosis is mandatory. Yes. Because uh, even for the extremities, some cases should be treated by rejection and endoprosthesis, and some patients are good enough for yeah. internal fixation. Yeah. And this can be decided by the prognosis. And like this case, if the patient has a spi uh, spinal cord injury. The patient has a very short ex life expectancy. The radiation therapy for palliation is good enough. But yeah. if the patient lives longer, yeah. sometimes uh, decompressed surgery is required. So I think the, some kind of prognostication is yeah. mandatory in the metastatic tumors. Okay. So, Matt? Yeah, we do this routinely, but mainly to prognosticate. Yeah, right. Uh, we, we, we can not use to, this. Yeah, not to decide the, the type of surgery, but for prognosis. Not, not, not to decide on the type of surgery, but really just to prognosticate. Right. Is Chen? Same. Same. All right. Okay. So, surgery, as the literature says, is considered for patients with a good response who are fit and only if uh, the earlier parameters are falling into place. 
If the patient is not able to undergo the surgery because of medical reasons, then definitive RT. And there is this spinal instability neoplastic score element, which takes into consideration the location, pain relief, bone lesion, radiographic spinal alignment, vertebral body collapse, and postural involvement to decide uh, the surgery or not. So coming to the, you know, sort of the end of the session, because we are now into the last two minutes, if we have to do a surgery for some reason in this particular patient, maybe she has not responded to the radiation and she has progressed as far as the neurodeficit is concerned, what sort of a surgery would you prefer? Okay. There are some options for surgery, but in the literature, the decompression only is not a good surgery. It is clear from the evidence. So I prefer to do a posterior decompression with posterior fixation. Right. I think it's a golden standard for metastatic spinal tumor. Some cases need a total en bloc spondylectomy, but it is very, very rare. Right. Okay. Professor Wang? Um, we'd, we'd be very happy if we had the professor, uh, spine surgeon, like Professor Katagiri with us. But we, we don't do the spine. We, we refer these cases to our okay. spine surgeons. Okay. Professor Chen? I'm not a spine surgeon either. So I refer to the spine team. And probably we can, can choose excite the material body uh, done by the, the Tomida, Professor Tomida mm -hmm. in Kanazawa. Okay. Because right. it's solid tradition. Okay, I think uh, we have come to an end of the session. Thank you, panelists, for a wonderful discussion. And thank you, audience, for being very patient and contributive to the session as well. Thank you. Uh, if, if there are any questions to the panel, uh, we could invite those since we have uh, a little bit of an extra time on our hands. Yeah, Dr. Nathan. Uh, panel, uh, panelists, uh, can, I, can I request to you to be please seated? Uh, there are a few questions from the, from the audience. So, um, Dr. Katagiri. Please. please. Uh, I'd just like to point out, um, I did a similar prognostication study uh, in 2000 and, I don't know, 2005 or something. It came out of General Clinical Oncology. And, uh, and I, re I did another one uh, in Singapore. And, because our database is actually based on a protocol that almost never requires surgery in thyroid CA in particular. So in thyroid CA, we use folli uh, follicular, uh, I mean, uh, colloidal yeah. iodine, uh, and we give it in multiple cycles. And we can end up giving it a lot, and it's only the very, very few patients uh, who've ended up with breakthrough disease, and I've had to do sacrectomies, and I've had to do pelvic disease, but I can assure you that they are very, very few in number. Occasionally, one may break a hip or something, but that is, in our database, barely any of them are, are thyroid CA. They come under the others category. But you see, in Dr. Katagiri's, and I, don't, I think you do great work, but Dr. Katagiri's database is distinctly uh, emphasized on thyroid disease because there is a disease... Uh, management protocol that does not require this. So th this is a big problem with prognostication and at some point I just gave up because I don't think you can rely so heavily on prognosticate, uh, prognosticating the patient based on these things. But I'd like to hear what Dr. Katagiri thinks on that point, that you can't really rely so heavily on these uh, scores to prognosticate. Not the Tomita score uh, yeah. in terms of procedure, just yeah. prognostication. Right. So we would like to hear from uh, uh, Professor himself. I, my scoring system includes about 800 cases with metastasis, and some part of the patients are thyroid cancers, but not concentrated to a thyroid cancer. And you, and you recommend a radical surgery for thyroid cancer? 
No, the question was how reliable can these prognostic scores be? Oh, that okay, was okay, his okay. question. Yeah. My score is uh, built up from zero point to 10 point. And I can say that the score zero to three can definitely have a longer survival. And score seven to 10 has a definitely poor survival. The problem is uh, score four to six. In these instances, I decide the treatment case by case and uh, look and uh, considering the patient's age or other metastasis. And some currently, the score four is considered as a radical surgery in my experience. Okay. Yeah, Professor Puri. Mic on? I think you'll have to switch it on. That's really technical. It's on, yeah. Okay, I think the point that both Suresh made and Professor Katagari making are somewhat similar. To be very honest, we talk about evidence-based medicine, but I don't think if you ask somebody to cross their heart and say that do they rely only on a prognostic score, be it for this or anything else, anyone would say yes, that's the answer, that I, the score says this, I will do this. We always use the score and our clinical experience of what we have seen on the case to try and make the best possible decision. I don't think anyone here is going to say that it's just going to be the score that is going to make them decide whether they're going to go down one path or the other. So we have to strike a balance and be realistic that yes, the score is one of the guiding points that we use when we are taking the final call. I don't think we're going to make that the absolute indicator. Yeah, perfect. Perfect end uh, uh, and perfect conclusion to the session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you very much.